नाही अजून कोणी हिमासमान झाला हे भाग्य भारताचे जलमास भीमाला हे भाग्य भारताचे जलमास भीमाला Baba Saheb Ambedkar looms over contemporary Indian politics. His name invoked more frequently than any of his contemporaries today. Politicians of all ideologies trip over themselves to lay any claim they can to his legacy. To decipher this political deification and in some cases appropriation and to assess what his ideas mean today to his followers who revere him and to India's unkept commitment to social justice I am talking to Professor Anand Teltumde he has just published a book called Iconoclast a biography of Dr Ambedkar and it joins a burgeoning literature on Baba Saheb but professor Tin Tumde's own writing and ideas and life have made him one of our foremost public intellectuals professor Tin Tumde thank you for making time and uh, i think the first question should be when there is so much of writing on dr ambedkar what is the gap that you think iconoclast should fill or is looking to fill you see from late Uh, 80s when Maharashtra government undertook to publish his writings yeah. and speeches, yeah. people came to know about uh, formal Ambedkar, mm. what he spoke, what he wrote, etc. If I go back to our childhood, you know, they, it used to be just folklore. It became virtually something like he is taken for granted as a god mm. that is mm. there. Yeah. There was not a single page which mm. was actually available for reading, mm. you know, yeah. to understand him. We used to have just a, a lesson, small lesson in Marathi, Madhya mm. Balpan. Mm. Uh, that was the only introduction that we had mm. about Ambedkar. And thereafter, again, it went on. Like after 60s, mm. <coughs> initially it was just confined to the list. It was just a folklore. Mm. But up late 60s, the entire political complexion changed in the mm. country. mainly because of the uh, changes that uh, were wrought in, in political economy mm. because of the congress government's policies congress aura of party which got us independence also faded away by yeah. then and this combination you know made something like electoral politics very competitive and in that uh, process rather the importance to vote banks came in mm. and dalit as organized under ambedkar right movement became very important mm. it became a cheapest Uh, vote block <coughs> to be captured and every political party actually try to get a chunk of it and needs to be understood that entire this vote ba- bank actually was told around ambedkar icon ambedkar emerged as a single <coughs> focal point of that uh, yeah, yeah fulcrum yeah around which it could yeah. be told you know there is no another example of yeah. this kind in the world over 200 million people yeah. could be having an emotional bond with a single icon there is no other example so there lies the thing maharashtra government uh, making his literature available to the people and people got quite thrilled because there are a lot of things to yeah <coughs> uh, which were not known and which were quite profound and people started writing and the literature uh, started piling up which is beyond the dalit community beyond the dalit yeah. community yeah. it it created lots of interest yeah. there was little bit pumping by the yeah. state there also yeah. because they they came ambedkar studies mm. Uh, mm. departments mm. in uh, universities, universities yeah. and all these things and all dalit uh, mm. people who were educated in humanities mm. actually being diverted towards that mm. so buddhist studies ambedkar studies mm. pali education etc yeah. etc et such kind of formal departments started getting open in the universities mm. and there was quite a fill up to these kinds mm. of activities mm. but that remained that is something like a placating the dalit intellectual and mm. making them some confined to this affair mm. but there was outside dalit also there were a lot of intellectual ki- kind of curiosity and people started writing on but what uh, happened was all these writings were in a way one sided mm. there was nothing like critical writing about 
Ambedkar or what his yeah. movement did, the kind of aftermath it reached mm. and what is the impact on Dalit movement per se. Mm. If you take stock of Dalit movement, then it became uh, quite a problematic mm. because by that time, Ambedkar, you know, the devotional aspects of the Dalit masses started increasing because the Dalit movement was totally devastated, there was no leader mm. and uh, people started uh, nostalgically saying that Ambedkar would again be reborn mm. and uh, take us to <laughs> our destination. Deliver so, us, yeah. Yeah. So, these are the contradictory kind of trends that they were happening through 90s, 2000 and beyond. As a result, there is a lot of uh, literature on Ambedkar that happened, not only in India, but even abroad mm. and a lot of interest uh, came in. What uh, Iconoclast does mm. is a bit departure, tries to de-layer Ambedkar from uh, myths and mythologies that were woven around him. Mm and a hagiography has got created around him. So is it a critical assessment, would you say, of his life and uh, of his ideas, of his uh, outlook? In a way, yes. Hmm. My basic purpose was to sort of present Baba Sahib Ambedkar as a man in flesh and blood. Hmm. Okay, as a human hmm. being who struggled genuinely hmm. and dedicatedly for the emancipation of firstly Dalits hmm. and he actually connected with the universal cause, the hmm. emancipation of humanity itself. So that was his loft vision hmm. that needed to be projected because making Ambedkar hmm. God served no purpose because God, God cannot be emulated, God cannot be learned from, God is to be just meant for worship hmm. and that's what happened to him. People actually shun understanding Ambedkar, mm. it, uh, they just had a uh, kind of stereotype ideas about which were paid whosoever talked louder, mm. that became something like Ambedkar. Mm. Uh, so this kind of notion needed to be questioned. Uh, question. Mm. Ambedkar needed to be projected to the people mm. that they could really learn from. When you anybody reads even a little bit that uh, Dr. Ambedkar has written, uh, even a quote somewhere or the other, there is something very electrifying in the way he expresses or he has expressed himself. And uh, you know, decades later, he sounds very contemporary, he sounds very young. What was your first connection with what Dr. Ambedkar's ideas were? which? really made you feel that, oh my God, this is revolutionary thinking. Uh, and when did that happen in your life? It's very difficult to really pinpoint when it happened. Hmm. So when I left my village, hmm. left my town in high school and came to Nagpur. To study was, engineering. Uh, to no, firstly, in, you had to do science. Right. So, Institute of Science, mm -hmm. I was doing pre university, mm -hmm. and there was a library, university library, where I used to go mm -hmm. with a dictionary in mm -hmm. hand because mm -hmm. that time mm -hmm. it was uh, needed, yeah. and started reading his uh, writings, you know, mm -hmm. and not many were available, and that was quite kind of eye opener. So. I started, uh, there was something like an annihilation of caste, yes. for instance. Yes. So it sounded uh, those days very profound, you know, mm. like a very in, inti intricate analysis mm. and it's run <coughs> through the very ancient past and comes down to the uh, uh, problem of caste mm. and he comes to something like an annihilation of what, what way the caste mm. could be annihilated. Mm. So even that time, as a 16, 17 years old boy, even I felt com uncomfortable because is it that caste cannot be annihilated? Mm. Because what he says ultimately is mm. that well, Hindus are not going to be pre going to be prepared to dynamite their mm. dharma shastras, yeah. Yeah. you know, to destroy mm. their dharma shastras. Mm. So I have chosen my way to go out of it. Mm. That means. What he meant was that he would quit Hinduism. Yeah. That time it yeah. was not very uh, <clears throat> something like it came a declared mm. poem, mm. etc. But he had uh, made up his mind mm. to quit Hinduism. Mm. But I would wish well mm. to for those who want to try it out. Mm. I felt that is it 
is it like that really that whether mm. caste cannot be annihilated mm. and you had to quit hinduism mm. what if if you even quit hinduism mm. you would stay still in india in mm. indian society mm. and this would linger on mm. so what do you use mm. so this kind of card i was it raised read, questions in your mind yes uh, his analysis the, mm. the dream impress and then i was reading something like buddha and dhamma mm. so quite a philosophical thing and i also start up it uh, naturally you get led into those mm. kind of things so mm. i started reading lots of buddhism mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> and started even uh, taking classes mm. in campus you mm. know for people who were interested in so making them understand what ambedkar is and things like so that i was doing but <clears throat> there was a mixed feeling kind one way it was quite uh, impressive impressive also mm. another kind some questions were coming into mind which i did not have proper solution even mm. but i did uh, sort of started feeling discomfort about the not everything was acceptable because right, right from the beginning you know like we were questioning things mm. so some way it happened with me and probably it is positive mm. and lots of negative mm. <laughs> as the experience as, as the experience goes mm. <clears throat> what is interesting is that um dr ambedkar's life is not representative or his early life his education is not representative of the masses followers that he has isn't it it's a life which is different very different in the way it played out though his personal experience of untouchability of uh, poverty are all there and uh, are in sync with what the community uh, of the uh, depressed classes then and the dalit community now has experienced his life was very still very different and he had the best education possible tell us a little bit about this start of his journey and his single minded quest for education we take for granted that baba saheb ambedkar came from you know mahar caste which mm. was the low, lowliest of the lowly mm. uh, in hindu ara hierarchy and then he was power, power very poor you know yeah the ambedkar himself used to say that we, there might not be any poorer man than me that i suffered poverty mm. etc but probably it was not true mm. that's what i wrote in i can a class yeah <clears throat> and uh, call this kind of uh, <coughs> island that formed in among mahars mm. as mahar military aristocracy mm. <laughs> because that culturally mm. or every wise you know mm. even economically were placed apart from the community mm. so the, he had that advantage mm. can you imagine like <coughs> something like his father mm. spoke fluent english mm. okay he reached the the highest possible position mm. in east india uh, army mm. east india company's mm. army so that kind of thing so they they were quite a cultured kind of thing and when ambedkar even speaks about this military mm. families used to be those days mm. in mahar speech it comes mm. okay mm. so he uh, uh, describes how they were educated how the even the ladies used to be masters of hindu scriptures mm. and they were discussing mm. and debating among um, uh, themselves mm. about the intricacies of the scriptures so this is not a normal profile of uh, mahars mm. okay the community was very very dilapidated there no nowhere kind of thing mm. his upbringing has been in bombay so he was quite well settled and then his father again had quite good acquaintances mahadev govind ranade justice ranade that time was said to be friends of ramji ambedkar mm. mahadev govind ranade was a something like a big personality so these kinds of contact kirskar master who introduced baba saheb ambedkar to, to sahaji rao yeah, gaikwad yeah. and got him scholarship yeah. even at the stage of college you know mm. doing mba in elphinstone college mm. he was given a 25 rupees scholarship so these are unusual things mm. then there after it follows that uh, the, he gets a scholarship to go abroad mm. to colombia yeah mm. 
So all these kinds of things were not normal with the North. So he got in very, very fortuitous kinds of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And thereafter I stretch it even that when he started the movement, mm -hmm. you know, again another Raja came to his rescue. Yeah. <laughs> Shahu Maharaj. Shahu Maharaj. Shahu. Yeah. I mean the two the two, two Rajas, two Rajas, ra two yes. Rajas to back you up. Yes. And and there was something like an alien state, you know. He was fighting basically mm -hmm. the Hindu caste system. Mm -hmm. The <laughs> dominant mm -hmm. Brahmin mm -hmm. caste out here. Mm -hmm. And the state was quite neutral, you know, it has its own agenda. But it was fairly neutral. So that also is a fortuitous, you know, it also bring, brings in something like a, a positive component to the struggle. So in all his formative days, these kinds of uh, fortuitous uh, circumstances came to his uh, share. And that made Baba Sahib Ambedkar. When he went to Colombia, the horizons, he was actually uh, amazed to see, you know, such a liberal atmosphere, etc. And and then he made best uh, of the opportunity that came to him and he focused on his studies. Okay. And he took lots of uh, trouble, you know. When you go to America, when those days, people used to do part-time jobs, you know, yeah. and finance yourself. His friend, you know, uh, one Bathena, yes, Naval Bathena, Parsi, Parsi yes, he was a <coughs> from an industrialist mm. family mm. and still he worked part-time mm. and earned. Ambedkar is the only person who did not work mm. and focused on his studies. Mm. So these kind of things come in, where, whereas his family uh, in Bombay was, was suffering a lot. Extreme hardship. Uh, Would you say this was selfish of him, the single-minded determination to pursue <laughs> knowledge and education? I would not say selfish, but mm. these are kinds of nuances, you know, of a mm. personality that is important to be known. When you make a person as a god, mm. so you have to understand what what kind of god uh, he was and all. Mm. So you have to bring his dedication to studies etc. overpowers those uh, other aspects. Uh, what are a couple of other things you feel in iconoclast where which will give people a fairer understanding or a, uh, or perhaps even a reassessment of uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar's life and work? Mm. My motivation was something mm. like to project Ambedkar as a real person. Yeah. Okay, yeah. because one needs to understand today the kind of uh, devastation of democrac democracy and all our public life mm. that has been happening for the last 10 years. Mm. If you take note of it, mm. there are two aspects that could be discerned. Mm. The biggest factor <coughs> in behind the success of BJP mm. Mm, mm. Uh, it has been something like a Hindutvaization or Brahmanization of OBCs. Mm. That's the biggest factor. Mm. Because there's a most populous band in Indian yeah. population, yeah. caste band, and which they actually uh, got uh, co-opted mm. <coughs> completely, internalized mm. that uh, kind of uh, ideology. Mm. The next is the co-optation of Dalit, mm. the wing of Dalit mm. that they have succeeded in. Dalits were intrinsically opposed to Brahmanism, you know, and uh, they did know that BJP is a Brahmanic party, but this is, this is the miracle that now th that has happened. In the wake of 2014 election, mm. I had written, that time I used to write a column, Margin Speak in mm. APW, mm. and one of the columns I had written in the wake of that, the three Dalit Rams mm. play Hanuman to BJP. Mm. <laughs> so those mm. Rams were Ram yeah. Vilas Paswan, yeah. Ra Ram Raj, mm. who became Udit Raj, mm. and Another one was Ra mm. the Ramdas Atole. Mm. RPI. <clears throat> so all these people, you know, mm. all these prominent mm. leaders had gone over to mm. BJP yeah, directly, yeah. indirectly. Yeah. And from there on, the <coughs> sort of degeneration began. So Modi in his theatrical style, yeah. you know, yeah. started some, something like projecting Ambedkar as his god, yeah. uh, constitution as his holy scripture, yeah. Yeah. all those kinds of things, actually one who are Dalits. Yeah. As I said earlier, uh, like Ambedkar becomes a fulcrum to yeah. 12 entire Dalit masses. Yes. So they worked on Ambedkar. Yeah. Now he came out with something like he will build Panchatirthas. Yeah. So you know? the so birth more place. than more than Congress ever did. Yes. <coughs> yes. So people thought that oh he is the man. He is yeah. actually 
he is not a brahmin incidentally yes, yes, and he is doing so much so us. much for um, uh, us and ambedkar mm. that means us yeah. so uh, there is nothing we what is wrong in uh, ra rather going over to bjp mm. and if you take a trajectory of uh, voting mm. from 2014 on mm and make a proxy of reserve seats. So reserve seats backed by BJP have been more than any other party. Mm -hmm. Okay, and 2019 election, actually the number of reserve seats that BJP backed were more than all the parties put together. And 24 also probably the similar mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. thing. Okay, so this is the indication enough that Dalits have <clears throat> really gone over in a big way to support BJP. So there, uh, the electoral success actually lies uh, there, Brahmanization of OBC and support of B, uh, the leads. Are you saying that because of this uh, co-opting of uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar's legacy of trying to say that look, look at how much we respect him, look at what all we are doing to uh, honor him. Yeah. Right, whether it's the Panchatit or the Ambedkar International Center, buying the properties in which he lived in in different uh, countries when he was studying there, all of this, um, you're saying that this has been enough to make the Dalit community feel that the BJP is its political party of choice? Yeah, unfortunately, that has happened. Mm. So. I could be wrong, but not much wrong. <laughs> My in motivation behind then writing is how do you thwart this process? Mm. You know, how do you make people understand mm. that uh, this kind of exploitation of emotional bond, you mm. know, the, <clears throat> uh, with Ambedkar mm. by the polit political class? Mm. Mm. <clears throat> how do you stop this? Mm. So, we will have to sort of confront. Mm. as to what Ambedkar is and systematically understand how he was neglected by the mainstream and how he was at what point in time, what forces mm. uh, became responsible for his Re sort of bringing in mainstream in way, yeah. and become a, something like a god. So yes. all these kinds of things could be then I thought what could be the format, it could be the biography rewritten. Yes. Okay. So that they can really, it becomes something like a quasi case study mm. for people to learn from. Mm. So that was my thinking. <clears throat> mm. So it is not uh, so much of uh, criticism or mm. something like it because his greatness cannot be challenged. Disputed, yeah. Okay, there cannot, it cannot be disputed. Mm. Mm. You know, he was great by all kinds of uh, this yeah, thing, established yeah, markers yes, yes. or by his own definition, hmm. by own, uh, his own definition in Ranade Gandhi and Jinnah was something like a great man is a scourge, hmm. he is a scavenger of the society, something like he contributes to hmm. societal growth, hmm. societal renewal, etc. etc. Ambedkar did a lot for that. Hmm. But that does not mean when actually great man hmm. <coughs> Con, uh, is reckoned as a bigger contribution to history. Mm. So he also is subject to sort of uh, the scrutiny mm. as to what, how far <coughs> his things have worked and how far his things have not worked. Mm. How would you like people to engage with this uh, going forward because it is you know if you on December 6th in Mumbai we see people come from different parts of the country different parts of Maharashtra for sure and perhaps even the country to pay their respects and they do it at great uh, you know they uh, endure quite a bit to do make this journey of faith of uh, and to articulate this emotional bond when people are used to seeing in this way, how do you make them take off the emotional lens and use a, an intellectual lens, a given that it is not, a, you know, to be an intellectual is also a privilege, isn't it? I would say it is a process. It is not going to happen in one shot, nor sure. I, a class like yeah. <laughs> the yeah. are going to sure. work anymore. Yeah. <coughs> there, I expected that there would be a sort of paid mm. criticism mm. that would firstly mm. shower mm. on it. Mm. And I am prepared for that mm. because when you want to go against the current, mm. it all comes to your share. Mm. So there is no issue. 
So one has to understand it as a process because even a handful of people understand it that we need to understand it, our surrounding in an objective term okay. uh, where we lie and uh, what has brought in <coughs> brought us here if we understand the forces and uh, and configuration of things mm. uh, then probably you can chalk out the way out yeah. you know yeah. but if you re really enjoy flowing in current mm. you will be going somewhere else this is the attempt of stopping that mm. so now it would take lot of time i do not know how much time and what happens etc because that is not in our uh, control sure, sure. but one hopes that a handful of younger generation who are actually facing a dark future you know what has happened to dalit is uh, quite a weird thing a middle class just a tip of iceberg like you know became visible you know educated middle class urban uh, 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 in urban settings yeah. post 91s they, liberal they economic form liberalization even diaspora so they are quite vocal yeah. they are quite visible yes. but underneath there is a huge iceberg you know mm. of misery and hopelessness mm. nobody looks at that mm. because <clears throat> whoever has come up mm. that is okay because now they they all these kinds of things might not matter also mm. they are actually gone out of the caste settings you know a person reaching america or europe etc doesn't really matter mm. but they are also hampering upon the same kinds of mm. things you know in a populist way so that thing so those people who are in position to take a new direction contribute to the new directions mm. etc probably probably learn from this mm. Mm. and there are lot of people in india also the new generation who are getting educated but facing dark future there are no jobs mm. nothing and uh, it's a very pathetic thing mm. it needed to be seen and experienced mm. so those people also should come out of their shell and see things in objective terms mm. so this would probably help them do that sure. it is not that and i i uh, explicated those things this is my ex Rep my reflections sure. you know they are not something like having a definitive value hmm they are not they are not to be taken like that they are the exemplars of how to question the established versions of history mm. okay mm. so people can have their own kinds of questions mm. so this actually just initiates it so talk a little bit about where we are as a society when it comes to the caste structure where dr ambedkar set out to annihilate um, you know untouchability was um, made illegal uh, but the caste set up persists and uh, every election every election whether it's at the center or you know at the state in maharashtra we've just concluded an election uh, in november every election just goes to prove the complete stranglehold that caste continues to have uh, in india and in indian society in indian politics and in every walk of life what is your sense and you've written pre previously another book the persistence of caste when the kerlanji massacre took place what is your um, explanation for this where do you see any optimism out of you know what reservation has created i don't know to what extent uh, you uh, noted it but something like in maharashtra election also maharashtra is the den of uh, ambedkar yeah. dalits yes, yes, you know yes yes so in this election <clears throat> 20 out of 29 reserve seats mm. have been backed by mm. bjp mm. okay the constituency is where in dalits actually are more than 15% mm. meaning more than the state average okay uh, something like 59 out of 67 mm. <clears throat> yes about 90% seats have been overwhelmingly gone to bjp with and they won it with double margin what does it bespeak mm. mm. yeah mm. so in my typical way of writing i said that india is more casteized today mm. than ever before so we generally speak about manusmriti manus thing ancient india etc etc but india was never casteized to this extent it was a way of life 
దట్ పీపుల్ లివ్డ్ యునో ఈవెన్ అన్టచబిలిటీ ఎట్సెట్రా ఎట్సెట్రా ఇట్ డిడ్ నాట్ రియలీ మ్యాటర్ యునో లైక్ ఫార్ బెంగాల్ యునో ఇట్స్ అ మచ్ డైల్యూటెడ్ వర్షన్ ఆఫ్ రెస్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఇండియా బికాస్ వెన్ వైల్ ఫార్మింగ్ ద షెడ్యూల్ కాస్ట్ లీస్ట్ ఆల్సో ద ఎన్కౌంటర్ దిస్ కైండ్ ఆఫ్ ప్రాబ్లమ్ అండ్ బెంగాల్ యునో ద టచ్ మీ నాటిజం కైండ్ ఆఫ్ థింగ్ did not exist mm. but there was a discrimination mm. of that could yeah. not be denied so <clears throat> how did it happen you're saying that earlier the way caste played out even though there were atrocities even though it you know it it was horrible it is a way of life today you're saying that same thing has been completely politicized and manipulated so it's at another level is that how i should understand what you just said uh, yes and no i mm. i'll i'll uh, put it this way mm. that earlier you know the caste system came how it came how it got set stabilized etc mm. okay that's all uh, <coughs> hypothetical now uh, we will not and speculative rather so we will mm. not get into that mm. but when we can understand mm. that mostly the society had internalized this system mm. so even the dalits also internalized it, their status and they thought okay yeah. this is what whatever the reason but we are born in mm. this and we have to abide by that mm. so these are upper caste we have to leave them like that and there is a norm that we should not touch them and this and that etc mm. so where is the question of atrocity because they everybody was behaving in an internalized manner mm. Mm, the hierarchy was internalized mm. so there is nothing like an offense you know to be punished mm. what is atrocities mm. but this entire thing changed mm. like in 68 kilwin many happened mm. and uh, a typically even in persistence of caste probably i explained this mm. that political economic changes you know mm. b- bringing up the capitalist paradigm with mm. green revolution and creating by, with land mm. reforms a uh, class of rich farmers in rural setting mm. uh, displacing brahmins from there <coughs> uh, assuming the uh, bottom of brahminism mm. by the uh, the backward caste mm. Mm. and there the conflict started coming in mm. because dalits were reduced to be rural proletariat with their true hands mm. Mm. they did not have that and that feudal kind of relationship of village of interdependence also had vanished because of capitalist forces mm. Mm. and the any assertion or any kind of uh, grievance etc was responded with a physical violence kilwin many probably marks it that as a inauguration of new genre of atrocities mm. so people just uncritically speak about how oh, these atrocities were happening for uh, 3000 years or 50000 years that is that is not true mm. <coughs> atrocities probably were not happening the, the discrimination was there mm. but this was internalized yeah. the atrocities yeah. no, you you just it, it it falls into place now discrimination was there atrocity is different from discrimination yeah but yeah. that discrimination yeah. also was internalized yeah. there was Got nothing yeah. nothing which actually manifests yeah. into physical violence right. but now it started from 68 from the word started having something like a physical violence mm. so t- to and the underneath dictum was teaching them a lesson mm. uh, to make them behave was it also a reaction to reservation because there has been such a backlash to reservation yes. isn't it yes surely so mm. because in my uh, opinion the reservation the mm. way they were formulated mm. actually were <clears throat> meant for preserving the caste so in constituent you know reservation did not come with uh, independence or constitu- constitution it came from colonial times itself you know mm-hmm. india <coughs> the government of india in 1935 provided for reservations mm-hmm. and a pune pact the clause 8 of pune pact actually provides for reservations in services and uh, educational institutes mm-hmm. for the upliftment of this thing the congress had agreed so those things were ca- <coughs> carried Forward. they had to be carried in the constitution so they came automatically so without anything also it could have come but they played a mischief this reservation where who played a mischief proliferated mm. those people at the helm of affair mm. hmm, the way mm. the constitution got written those people actually 
uh, used these kind of things very skillfully. The reservation actually were used mm. to preserve caste. Mm. See, when they bombastically declared that uh, <coughs> and, uh, the untouchability was uh, abolished, uh, became unlawful, how untouchability can go away if the caste survive? Yeah. Uh, it's, the, it's not my question, yeah. even Ambedkar also yeah, yeah. questioned it at one time. But in Constituent Assembly, he did not say mm. anything. Mm. Okay. Mm. So, the castes were preserved because with something like a tacit alibi that you had to do social justice to these, these people and reservation needed to be given, the caste will be there, caste identities have to be preserved. Mm. And this is the way they, they, mm. pre, they proliferated reservations mm. to firstly STs, yeah. which were not there in colonial mm. time, mm. then OBCs, mm. you know. OBCs, yeah. the identity of which were was not even known. Yeah. My and argument, then, my mm. argument is not that these mm. people did not deserve or something mm. like. I'm mm. not, I'm not getting into that. Mm. You could really abolish even caste when you abolished untouchability mm. because with scheduled caste, that schedule was prepared during colonial time. Mm. That was a frozen schedule. There was not an opening to that. Mm. Okay, so a people. <clears throat> suffering the untouchability, etc. in Indian society were clubbed together as a quasi class. Mm. Now they actually snapped the umbilical cord with the Hindu caste system. Mm. So this could have been very well uh, mm. uh, done, mm. but they did not do that. Mm. Mm. And the pressure caste. Uh, as a result, now all these kinds of things flow. <clears throat> So where are we today? Where are we today? Uh, where the where the hold? Where the you know where the hold that caste has on Indian society? Uh, it is at its worst. Yeah, with <coughs> see as I see when these neoliberal policies etc were adopted. That mm. time also I was re right, uh, observing the world and writing like uh, the the old orthodoxies or so old fundamentalism, the religi religiosities, mm. etc., etc., had researched mm. because of the crisis it created for, livelihood crisis that created for common man. So, this was the way out, you know. So, now it has actually taken a different turn in the fascist turn. The neoliberal model also failed mm. and now <coughs> most of the world is going a fascist way. Yeah. In India, we have own version of fascism, mm. you know. Mm. So, here it is Declaredly so that they want to sort of uh, uh, bring in the old dictum. Mm. Old dictum in what way? They would actually camouflage it mm. with the nationalism, cultural nationalism, etc., yeah. etc. Et mm. But what does it mean? It means actually what 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 was the predominant aspect of the culture here? It was caste. Yeah. So now now this those kinds of caste based on varna or caste names etc. cannot be recreated mm. in modern mm. era. Probably that is out of question. But the in essence that kind of hierarchized kind of system they would like to bring in mm. and this is what the game is mm. so those people by default you know mm. like who fell behind like uh, like Dalit for instance yeah. they would be Dalits only okay give them an another fancy name etc mm. but they would be they will have to live at their rank mm. Mm. this is what the kind of paradigm is coming in mm. <clears throat> as far as uh, the situation of uh, Dalits are mm. concerned, the practical mm. situation is concerned. Mm. Even the untouchability has not gone away. Mm. You know, people, I do not know how they speak uh, this thing. Uh, right from 50s till uh, 2011, that's the last survey, three surveys happened during this century. Mm. And all surveys actually <coughs> uh, reveal that untouchability in its very uh, actually survives still in a very significant mesh. So, how, what is what has happened now? Mm. <coughs> caste, of course, is there. Mm. Caste discrimination, even in a, uh, uh, the very modern sectors of economy like yeah. IT sector, yeah. etc. Recently, there was a and in the march, US, uh, march yeah. in Bangalore yeah. Huh, yeah. that IT em <laughs> sector employees. Uh, bringing in the caste discrimination mm. or even US, yes. the caste discrimination mm. in the, uh, wherever Indian ca so, uh, community so is going in. Are you saying then we have to live with 
broadcast and there is no way that this can you know this can uh, diminish its impact on indian lives because clearly that doesn't seem to be and if we go with political and why political even social and cultural uh, you know experiences uh, people don't seem to want to shed their caste affiliations for the most part no if you really see india does not have future unless it transcends caste this is a very very um, <laughs> <laughs> a vicious kind of uh, mm. <coughs> virus mm. that needed to be <coughs> done away with and that can oh. that can come with the non caste solidarities among people mm. so class that, solidarities which yeah. is what you have yeah. so do do you think dr ambedkar could have done more in his time to do away with caste or was it was it too loaded against him the political establishment at that point yeah i i uh, yeah that that was an opportune time when baba saheb ambedkar actually articulated this movement that was an opportune time to strategize it in this manner to have something like a sectarian view that our uh, thing because how do you understand caste caste does not have a name there is something like a finite number people give but that's not a caste caste probably come down to individual you know it's a notion of hierarchy that you are either low Better or, or worse. above I, I mean me. superior or inferior Haan. are you then a pessimist today uh, on this front no because what is an what is a you know i'm anti caste what does that really mean because i can be anti caste but uh, you know it everywhere else it is in operation so i'm saying are these individual choices are these groups are this police uh, political action and uh, who is going to show the way because no everybody benefits from keeping the status quo as we can see uh yes <laughs> that's a very good question but i the simple answer is that social process is not a uh, electrical switch you know so yeah, <clears throat> so that cannot be switched on and off just like that so it will be a process you know if people understand what is what etc what is in their interest what their future should mm, be like mm, mm. they would configure the way it it would happen slowly and uh, <clears throat> elsewhere the caste like institutions have been gotten over uh, in many places mm. it even india is a unique country because of the size and mm. it's a subcontinental phenomenon but it's not that a caste uh, like institution really uh, existed in india like for instance korea there was very similar kind of thing mm. and in the turmoil you know in the war and capitalism it just disappeared that even not even anthropologist know that it existed just mm. Uh, uh, mm. just a few decades ago mm. Uh, and uh, so is the case with so it's not something like uh, you have to uh, live with people will have to slowly now lot of um, uh, water has flown down the ganges it has become very complicated complex etc etc so this is what the accumulation dirt has been and now the new generation if he wants to really see uh, the way through hmm. they like to clean the dirt you mentioned uh, you know a little while earlier in the in, in the conversation uh people from the dalit community who had had access to education who are very successful economically who are prosperous who who are uh, you know who can lead the conversation on public platforms do you think they are living up to their expectations uh, do you think they are living up to their potential in terms of change makers in terms of being able to go beyond caste or take people beyond caste see what happen is happens is <laughs> i have seen from closer angle so sure. most of the people you know once you get job yeah. then they uh, actually stop uh, uh, thinking and reading you know yeah <clears throat> Uh, either they would uh, mm. <laughs> most of the energy would go in sort of hiding the caste or something like mm. that 
or when it comes to they would uh, be active and and there their uh, caste associations hmm. in companies etc hmm. everywhere the sc st associations hmm. are hmm. there no hmm. so up to that but they also do not function so most of the times is the withdrawal symptom that the they are confined to their family etc etc and the way so <coughs> way of relating to society is hmm. through ambedkar hmm. you hmm. pay attention to something like on 6 december most of these white collar people also hmm. go there and hmm. notionally mark their presence that's it <laughs> one question on dr ambedkar's association with the constitution you know i mean in election campaigning baba saheb ka constitution samvidhan yeah, yeah, you know yeah. bo- all parties uh, are uh, constitution dr ambedkar that yeah, is the yeah. link True. what what do you want people to understand where uh, dr ambedkar's relationship with the constitution it is, is attributed to ambedkar whatever the constitution is baba saheb ka samvidhan hai but it is not so granville austin mm-hmm. who wrote in, in <coughs> making of india's constitution this is mm-hmm. taken as an authority mm-hmm. on uh, constitution and he writes that not a single word that has gone into constitution mm-hmm. uh, without approval of the congress ol- oligarchy mm-hmm. october 47 mm-hmm. the b n rao's draft was mm-hmm. there beca- because of whatever constitu- uh, uh, committee discussions happened and he discussed with the uh, experts in america mm-hmm. london ireland canada etc etc and on that basis he created a draft that draft was examined by the drafting committee after ambedkar became mm-hmm. so some drafting committee came into being mm-hmm. and baba saheb then made a <coughs> his draft mm-hmm. in february mm-hmm. 1948 which made basically 20 changes including preamble mm-hmm. that he wrote a preamble Mm, uh, and mm. and second the significant change was delineation of limitation on fundamental rights mm. so which ambedkar would uh, proudly say mm. that our fundamental rights are not absolute we have kept an escape route for mm. <coughs> everything okay so this is the kind of thing so these things needed to be understood so it's not numbered case opinion it actually went from sub committee to the congress ministry then to congress parliamentary party and then to Cong- the nehru patel azad etc mm. so through that the words filtered and ultimately entered the constitution mm. now baba saheb ambedkar in 52 writes like i was used as a hack Hmm. I was the first person to burn down this constitution, etc., etc. He spoke uh, later so on also. Why did he get associated? Again, is it political convenience? This is a this is the mystery. Now, why he did? His most biggest anxiety was to uh, hmm. have the safeguards for Dalits hmm. in the Constituent Assembly. But as I said, you know, the what are the safeguards in constitution? The reservation actually way to come in because nobody could really uh, give it up. Mm. So it came from the thing and uh, were instituted in the constitution. Mm. What are the safeguards? There is nothing. Safeguards were in the form of something like a fundamental rights, etc., which actually are universal. Yeah. Now it's not confined to the law. Yeah. And with an escape route, mm. that safeguard actually get deleted. You know. <coughs> so when when state wants me to be in jail i go to jail that's it those fundamental right do not prevail mm. so it becomes something like a, there is a st- constitution is the statist thing mm. and it is spoken loud that they wanted a very very strong center mm. and strong state mm. yeah. mm. <laughs> uh you know this this should be many many conversations right <laughs> i am trying to encapsulate so many things in some uh, you know extempore way on on your book and your ideas uh, but let's uh, how you know the 30 31 months that you were incarcerated that you were in jail uh, how has that changed you and how is life today while you're on bail and you have stiff conditions that you have to keep maintaining the way the things were happening so it it 
it was not very unthinkable uh, as such but probably still i was under till un, uh, until i had to really surrender or my first kind of uh, bashing application was rejected by supreme yeah. court and that yeah. time i had written an open letter to the public you yeah. know yeah. so that was the shattering moment yeah. you know i i still had a notion about myself that i would not be touched with my position you know in corporate world okay. the that etc because such kind of profile people yeah. were rarely touched yeah. you know politically yeah. so that was my notion but when it happened uh, i had lot of time uh, during which actually i can class also was written so <laughs> to reconcile with these kinds of things yeah. so when actually i surrendered that time it was not a shocker i was a very normal person i went uh, with a very clean yeah. mind and, yeah. uh, determination to think through only because of my health etc i was thinking that i will not come alive Alive, I mean, come out alive. That was the only thing. So something like bidding goodbye to uh, world. But it was okay. Uh, fortunately, nothing much happened. Mm. I did have uh, contract uh, COVID, etc. Mm. Probably would have died, but mm. survived. So jail is jail, of course. Was personally, I did not had any big hardship, etc. Came out luckily. Mm, and, uh, uh, within 31 months you know my uh, our co accused are still languishing in jail yes. there half of them are still there yes. you know and uh, it's a seventh year for such a <coughs> nonsensical case you know to incarcerate some pe- innocent people for seven years this itself actually exposes the character of the s- Uh, constitution exposes the co- uh, character of the institutions exposes yeah. character of the state yeah. and as even the society mm-hmm. because society also is, uh, it doesn't feel anything about it so does it leave you cynical about about human hmm? nature does it does it leave you cynical does it leave you Uh, depressed where does this leave you no, and your intellectual because inquiry humans are humans your, uh, hmm. you see am i fortunate or unfortunate i don't know but uh, we, uh, my training has been in sort of management and uh, very practical things we do not give a damn to theoretical things if the humans are like that so be it it they are givens so now how do you do now, what do you do with that with these kinds of Uh, uh, jokers also you have to bring in desired change so work for that that's all so i am not creeping about humans being insensitive or this become not understanding etc there is given you know world was like that only so we take it as a given there are certain things which are given which you do not have a control on but how do you mold that and actually still reach your goal that is what the approach should be <laughs> That's a good good thought to close this conversation professor Dale Tumde. Thank you so much. I deeply appreciate uh, you know your work and your our conversation today. Uh, let the process of su- swimming against the tide <laughs> begin. Yeah, thank you so much. I enjoyed talking to you. We'll That's keep a nice talking. nice of you. We'll keep talking. Thank you. Jalma sabhi ma